We have a little group of companies here. We have the multiple airport holdings, which owns 51% of the shares in Notal Airport Limited, which owns 100% of the shares in Notal Airport Bus, and 49% of the shares are still held by the Time Council. Now, the treaty talks about an undertaking. So the first thing we need to identify is how does the word undertaking relate to these companies? Now that may not be immediately obvious because this isn't 100%, this is 51 and 49%. A justiciable issue about what is the undertaking with which we are concerned here? What are the boundaries of the undertaking? Uh, what sort of possibilities do we think we have in terms of the boundary of the undertaking? Would you, in your court, admit a claim against all four defendants? Or would you reject any of them? Or would you say you will listen to arguments? Or would you say you want to receive evidence? And what arguments might occur about who should be in this group of companies? The, the airport serves an area. So you've got an interesting question about what's the market here? Are there rival airports? Are there other possibilities? And what market are we considering? It's a market for bus services from this airport. The fact that there may be another airport may or may not be of any relevance. The buses, some of them go to resorts in Notal, and some of them go to resorts across the border in Westland. So there are a series of resorts along the coast. And the buses are going from the airport, and some of them are crossing a member state border. You may have to apply both national law and consider Article 101 and 102. You've got the question of the scale of the fees and interestingly enough my computer went and changed I had put fair F-A-I-R but it had of course seen buses and coach so it changed it to F-A-R-E in other words the amount that you pay for a bus fare <laughs> it should be fair and reasonable so there was an investigation earlier on. So there's already a file in the National Competition Authority in Norland. We're in paragraph 7. But that investigation didn't lead to any decision. It led to an undertaking. And so the file ends with an undertaking by the Town Council an undertaking which expired in 2009. And then the following year, freed from that undertaking, the Town Council sells off a 51% share. Now, 51% share normally bespeaks control as between 51% and 49%, but you might have interesting discussions about what is really going on here and who is really managing. When you begin to consider disclosure, you may want to consider asking, is there a management agreement? Do you want to see the minutes of board meetings? Who is appointing the management? What is, what's the reality of these relationships? And what are the realities of this relationship? 
You see, these people up here may say, this is entirely independent. We never knew about this. This seems unlikely, but it would be a matter of evidence. By the time you get to paragraph 8, there are significant increases taking place in the fees. In other words, the fees which were fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory are suddenly no longer do you, are you familiar with FRAND? FRAND is the abbreviation for fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory. But suddenly there's a significant increase in fees Although at that stage, there's still open access, so anybody can take their bus into the airport. And at this point, West Bus complain to the Norland National Competition Authority. So there may be papers relating to that complaint, but as a matter of administrative priority, the National Competition Authority do not act. So then, in 2014, they still want more money from this facility. And so they put it out to tender and they give some indications of the minimum acceptable tender. And because of that, the responses they get are substantially identical because each party is trying to meet the requirements, but no more. And so in 11, what happens is that Notel Bus gets the exclusive rights and is required to pay a particular set of fees. Now at that point, Notel Bus is concerned that this may infringe European law. Mm -hmm. And so they go to the authorities in this case the European Commission, and they make a leniency application. But the Commission have not yet started their investigation. So that's the situation before we get to any claim. So the first question that arises is, where do you bring the claim? Now, it's worth looking back at this diagram and asking yourself, what are the financial realities likely to be? We know that there was substantial borrowing here to enlarge the airport. This is a big multinational company based in Spain. And you'll remember that the, the fundamental rule in the Brussels regulation is that you sue in the company of domicile of a defendant. Multiple airport holdings is domiciled in Spain. These three, these three entities are all domiciled in Norland. So there's a choice for West Bus services and West Bus coaches of where do they sue? Do they sue in Norland or do they sue in Spain? Or both? Now why might they sue in both? Well, they might sue in both and they've got to be very careful which order they sue in because the moment they launch an action in one country that court becomes seized of the matter. They may want to sue in another country for protective reasons. So if they want the primary action to take place in Spain then they sue first in Spain and secondly in Norway. And they might sue in both in order uh, to get the advantage of protective measures to protect documentation or to obtain documentation in the second country. Or they can do it the other way around. So it is possible for them to start an action in both places. Uh, but 
one will be the first action and they will then be seized of the matter. You'll remember that there's been a leniency application to the European Commission and within the European Competition Network they will have to decide under Regulation 1 of 2003 which authority is taking a lead. And in this case you'll see in paragraph 13 that it is the Norland authority that is taking a lead. And so there is now a file in the Norland National Competition Authority. So in 14, the first request is for an injunction. The injunction has two parts. The first part of the injunction is that the access should be restored to the airport, and the second part is that that access should be on fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms. And then they're also seeking damages and costs. Now, I don't know in your system, at this stage, is an injunctive remedy possible in Finland? Yes, it is. Possible? In Belgium also. In Belgium? Yes. And in Romania? I don't think so. Yes. Yeah. Now, the reality is that that might bring the whole thing to an end if the airport were forced to go back to fair, reasonable, non-discriminatory terms, the, the terms of the undertaking given uh, back in 2004. But what actually happened in the case in England was that Peter Roth refused the injunction and sent it for a trial. Now, the reason for that is that um, they were arguing that the, there wasn't actually space. So in the judgment, you get a nice picture of the airport. And they, what they said was, our bus stands are full of buses. There is no room for any more buses. <laughs> now, this raised some interesting issues and Vivian Rose decided to go and visit the bus stands and have a look for herself. Peter didn't have that opportunity. So there was a conflict of fact about whether it was possible to get any more buses on. Uh, and what they discovered was that people were leaving their buses and going off and having lunch and things. So it was possible to get more buses in. So it's possible the whole case could be solved very quickly. It's also possible that it won't be solved very quickly. Now, the th so you've got, that's what Westbus want. They want to be back in the airport. You've then got no tour bus. They want the contract declared void. And they feel they've been overpaid. So they want damages. Now the reality is that for them, a return to fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory terms with open access would deny them their monopoly, but it would at least get them back to where they were in the 2004 settlement. So those are all people who are intimately involved in what is going on because they are the people who are actually providing, or in one case being denied the opportunity to provide, the services. The fourth claimants are a major package tour intermediary specialising in this market, but registered in Luxembourg. Now, they're a Luxembourg business. Can they sue in Luxembourg? No, quite right, they can't sue in Luxembourg. The fact that they're registered in Luxembourg does not avail them, they're not a consumer. Uh, the harm has been done in Norland. The defendants aren't registered in Luxembourg. They're not domiciled in Luxembourg. <coughs> they can't sue in Luxembourg. What are they doing? They're passing these costs through.
They're seeking damages for overpayment. What heads of damage do you think they can claim? What in, in Finland could they claim, do you think? Loss of the profit. Loss of profit. Yeah. yeah, they can claim for loss of profit. They can't actually claim for the overcharge because yeah, they pass yeah, the yeah, overcharge yeah. straight through. We'll come back to why that's important because we're going to have to assess that loss of profit. So now we then have the fifth claimants. They're registered in England and Wales, but as we've already seen, they can't claim in England and Wales because uh, that's not uh, proper under the Brussels Convention. They don't have any direct contracts because they contract indirectly through a Guernsey registered company. One of the things which amazes me nowadays is if I go on a train from London to Newcastle in England, on my credit card statement, that is a transaction which is handled in Luxembourg. I can't understand why. Maybe, but quite often in these transactions, you've got a maze of companies. And trying to spot what money is where is interesting. Now these people, again, they're seeking damages for overpayments. And what are we going to be thinking about as we think about these damages? Again, we're going to be thinking about, did they pass these costs through? to their customers? Or is the market for holidays such that they couldn't raise the prices without deterring people from taking their holidays in Norland and Westland? And again, that's an issue of fact to which we will need to return. So there we are. We've, we've got a, an action which <coughs> may have started in Spain may have started in Norland, but we do at least know which action was started first. And now we've got to think about how are we going to manage this and what, on what matters are we going to need evidence and what sort of evidence do we need people to provide? Now, some of the evidence will be evidence that is sought by the claimants, and some of the evidence sought will be evidence sought by the defendants. The defendants will seek to minimize their liability, and they're absolutely entitled to do that. They're absolutely entitled to say, Some of these defendants suffered no loss because they passed it through. Or no loss because Westbus wasn't making any money anyway and they saved so much money on labour costs and fuel costs and leasing buses that frankly their, their losses were minimal. And there you have an interesting question of fact to, to examine. So think for a moment what sort of evidence are you going to be looking for when it comes to disclosure? What, what sort of documents are you going to expect these companies to reveal? And then we'll look at some of the issues and ask ourselves what, what might be said. Okay. So if, if one looks at, at the treaty, what the treaty uh, talks about is all agreements between undertakings and one or more undertakings with a dominant position. Who in here <coughs> is the undertaking? And there is case law on what is called parental liability. There is also an article by Hurley and Scott on parental liability in European law. <laughs> You're interested in that. So it is actually a matter of fact how control is being operated in this group of companies. And uh, Christian's quite right, that what you would be looking for is, is there a management agreement? And what are the actual facts 
of who is appointing the management and what control is being exercised either through the board or through management control arrangements. And you have to look at what is happening right the way through. So you've got this question about control. Would that be sufficient documentation? Is there a rebuttable presumption? Now, if, if there's 100% shareholding, there's a rebuttable presumption of control. That 49% raises much bigger issues. The 51% may or may not, and so you can examine that in terms of the facts. So, does it have a dominant position? Now, remember we've got to think about what, what is the market here? It's not a market for air flights, it's a market for bus, the, bus, bus, the buses and the coaches. Now, it, in our court, we have held that a crematorium in a small town can have a dominant position. There are other crematoria in Britain, but the distance between this crematorium and other crematoria means that this one crematorium has a dominant position. So my suspicion is you don't need much evidence to demonstrate a dominant position. Now you could ask the parties, do you agree that there's a dominant position? Now actually what happened in the case underlying this was they left that issue on one side and went straight to abuse. So they held the hearing on the basis that they would assume dominance and only come back to dominance once they dealt with abuse. Now, what's important about that is that sometimes examining the abuse helps you to understand whether there's dominance. In other words, when you examine what is actually going on in terms of the behavior, it helps you understand the nature of the market. Any other evidence you would need in relation to dominance? So you don't have to examine first the uh, dominancy and then the abuse, you can switch it. In our system, you can switch it. You can, as a matter of case management, take the abuse as a preliminary issue without dealing with the dominance. There are other circumstances in telecommunications law where you have to demonstrate dominance before anything else happens. Now, the reality is that uh, if dominance, if the allegation of dominance was challenged, then you would need to examine the allegation of dominance. And if the allegation of dominance was challenged, you then need to adduce evidence as to the nature of the market. Now, much of that evidence would be available to you from public documentation. Uh, in the case of the United Kingdom, there's a civil aviation regulator who probably already publishes statistics on the airports. Now, in your country, the same may well be true. So there may well be evidence from public sources. Uh, but uh, you search for evidence, not national evidence, for this area, no? For, for the area where the, the case is. That's right. Okay. That's right. So the to, to see if so it's the usage it. it's the usage around the airport <coughs> and, and, and the, the second question you search for evidence national evidence for a long period of time or just one two year before that's a very good point now remember that there is a file in the national competition authority dating back to two thousand and four now. That investigation ended with an undertaking. Can you order that evidence which relates to this party? Under the new directive. You can only go back to five years? Is it that what you're suggesting? Well, it's it's an interesting question because of course the it all dates, it predates all this. And I'm not sure I have an instant answer. What do you think the answer is? 
a previous settlement of a relevant matter? Well, I'm not sure. I think you might have an argument. Um, but it is well worth knowing that the file is there. And remember, you can invite the competition authority to come and talk to you about it. But certainly, if dominance is challenged, then you may have to get some evidence about it. I, I think in this case it's quite difficult to challenge dominance. So, if we go back to 101, um, we have to ask ourselves, wh what is going on here in, in relation? Is there an agreement? And the answer is, we know there's an agreement because there was a tender and then there was a contract. And so at the very least, you're going to be asking for a copy of the contract. The claimants can provide you with a tender and either, I mean, uh, the, you're going to get a copy of the contract from note or bus because they are also claimants. So they are likely to provide that to you uh, straight away. So then, you've then got to ask what, what is going on and Again, the evidence of exclusion and refusal to supply is fairly straightforward because you've got the evidence of the tender and you've got the evidence of the contract. So you probably don't need to go much further than that uh, because that, that evidence is before you. Have you now got sufficient evidence to determine whether there is an infringement. So we've got an undertaking, or at least we've got the evidence relating to the undertaking. Will we now have enough evidence to determine whether there's an infringement of 101 and 102? Anything else we need at that stage? I think we have to, to prove that the fairs to ah, okay, right. Now, that's, that's, the, so there are two questions about abuse. Question one is, was there exclusion? And we've got the evidence for exclusion. Question two, and this is the, the question uh, in the uh, local bus action, is that there was overcharging. What sort of evidence are we going to need to demonstrate that? Now, this is the company here that operates the bus terminal. So, are you wanting to see the management accounts? How are you going to assess the reasonableness of these charges? What numbers do you want produced? The normal profit margins in that sector. Normal profit margins? So, uh, comparative analysis from other airports, yeah? And indeed you could, this is where a third party comes in, you could inquire of other similar airports what they are charging. And that would enable you to do a benchmarking exercise on what looked reasonable. Now this is a point where you may have an expert. You could have an expert appointed by the parties jointly. You can have an expert appointed by the court. You can have rival experts appointed by each of the parties. There are a variety of ways in which that could be assessed or you can assess it yourself. But you need some way of assessing how reasonable are those costs and what is a reasonable profit margin. Now that may also get you into the question of the cost of capital. Remember that 
there's been quite a lot of borrowing here. And you may have to ask yourself the question, <coughs> is there a state guarantee going on here? See, this was a time council. And it's quite possible that behind the borrowing by a time council lies a state guarantee of borrowing. Very different if this is a commercial borrowing. So you've got some interesting questions about the cost of capital and also the cost of dividends being paid by this company to that company. And what is reasonable there as distinct from what is actually going on. I mean, the, the cost down here may be because an enormous amount of money is being taken out of these companies in management fees. I mean, it was very reasonable. We have improved the management, so we just charge a small 50% management uplift on the income. Very reasonable because of the sheer quality of management that we have brought to the bus station. You understand? So you, you're going to have to examine, you're going to need sufficient evidence of what is in those costs to see whether the costs underlying the prices uh, are abusive or not. Because it's quite likely that in a group of companies some interesting things are going on. Now, if the tax levels in Notol are higher than the tax levels in Spain, then it's quite likely that the profits are being made in Spain, and if it's the other way around, it's quite likely that the profits are being made down here. So there are going to be interesting questions of, of what is going on there. So an understanding of the accounts. Now, proportionality, do we just want one year, or do we want to go back to look at the progression of these fees? Now, remember there was an undertaking about fair and reason which ran out in 2009. Do we want to examine the series of fees from 2009 to the present day? Would that be reasonable and proportional? Not much trouble? Probably okay. That's all about infringement. Anything else we want on infringement? So we've got an undertaking, we've got an infringement. So the next link we've got to consider is causation. How far are the damage to these various defendants caused by the behaviour of the alleged infringer. And what evidence do we need to demonstrate causation between the infringement and the damage? So, some of it may seem fairly straightforward. Um, in the case of, of Westbus, there's been a refusal to supply which has stopped their services dead. They can't collect passengers or deliver passengers to or from the airport. Clear causal link? Do you need any evidence on that? Any further evidence? They're seeking damages for overpayments. The causation of the overpayments is fairly straightforward. You've got the contract in front of you which gives the payments. Uh, you probably don't need much more in the way of evidence for them. So go to the fourth claimants, PTA, where life is going to become a little more interesting. How do we spot the causation between what is going on and their losses? So they're providing these virtual services. They are passing through the costs, but they're claiming loss of revenue opportunities. What sort of evidence are they going to have to produce? Now, there are, here you've got uh, an interesting situation. 
If it's a cartel, then there is a presumption of harm, and the burden shifts to the defendant to demonstrate that there was no damage in qualitative terms. If it's an abuse of a dominant position, then there's a sense in which proving abuse demonstrate that there was an abuse. But here you've got somebody claiming loss of revenue opportunities. And how far is their causation between their loss of revenue opportunities and what sort of evidence do you need there? The number of tourists and if the number went down? That's right. So you have to look at the elasticity of demand. And it's across the elasticity of demand between, well, there are two aspects of the, of the cross elasticity. One is, does the total number of tourists go down? And two, do tourists actually go elsewhere? And then you have to ask yourself the question, in terms of PTO, do they, do they lose that market because they specialize in Norland and Westland? Or if they have a wider specialization, do the tourists merely go to Lanzarote instead? So you're going to need some evidence from PTO of what happened to their numbers and some estimate of elasticity of overall demand and cross elasticity between these holidays and other holiday opportunities. Now, how you achieve that is an interesting question, and that's where economists may come in and have opinions. Now, what, what matters here is understanding where the burden lies and uh, who's got to prove what to whom. So you have to bear that in mind when you're thinking about that. So then you have the fifth claimants. <laughs> They are major sellers of package holidays, including holidays to Norland and Westland. Now, arguably, when the customers are going through on the internet or going through the brochure, and they see that prices in Norland and Westland are a bit higher this year, then they go to Lanzarote or wherever it is instead. So there's going to be a, a real issue of what losses they have suffered and how far they have been able to pass through the costs to their clients. Now I have to tell you this is, this is where it becomes quite difficult and you can have economists which quite, take quite different views on this and as a court you're going to want some information but you've got to recognize that this is going to be a matter of opinion at the end of the day. And what the directive empowers you to do is to estimate. The, you, you, in order to make the remedy efficient, you have to be able to estimate what is, has happened here. So, the defendants are going to be looking for evidence that actually nothing much happened. The number of tourists didn't change very much. There were no real losses. Yes, there may have been slight overcharging, but it was very minimal and none of these people suffered. Westbus may have suffered, but as I've explained, Westbus, let's ask ourselves, what evidence do we need about Westbus? and their coaches. What did they lose? The now, what <coughs> sort of numbers are we looking for for Westbus? Because if I'm the defendants, I need to understand the nature of Westbus's business and whether they were making money, losing money, and maybe this was a godsend to them. They were losing money on these services. They should be thankful to us. They had, they'd been competing so strongly that, uh, this is going to be the argument, you know, that it was an enormous benefit to them to stop providing these services. 
So what sort of evidence do we need from West Bus and West Coaches? Evolution of the figures? Evolution of their figures. And an understanding of their fixed and variable costs. See, in an operation like this, many of the costs are variable costs. So the, the drivers, the fuel, the maintenance, uh, to some extent the leases on the coaches are variable costs. So they may not have lost much money. So you've got to analyze what was the loss of profit and to understand their numbers. Now, again, proportionality, how far back do you want to go? Are you going to go back to 2004 when the undertaking was given, or 2009 when the undertaking came to an end, or 2008 to give you a year of standard operation? And to give you some sort of, now what, you, you know, you'd have to make up your mind. How far back do you want the numbers to go? What depth of numbers do you want? Do you want uh, what's happened to their staffing numbers, their overheads, their fuel costs, and so on? Now, does anything we've said so far seem disproportional to this case? All fairly proportional? Now, that are questions which, which we've seen those elasticities are going to be questionable because it's unlikely that anybody has got really crisp numbers about the elasticities. And also the, the parties may argue that circumstances changed. The weather last year was really bad and that was depressing numbers. How do you deal with that? You, you may have to look at what happened to overall holiday numbers in a much wider sense and see if there are uh, industry-wide statistics available so that you understand what was going on in the background. And sometimes that's important to, to put a context on the numbers that you're being given from the parties. I don't think so. I don't think so either. It's a purely judicial question. It's a purely judicial question. Yeah. OK. So now we have the quantification of damage. And we've got various parties making various claims as to overpayments, so actual loss, and loss of profits from lack of opportunity. Some of those are exclusionary losses. In other words, West Bus and West Coach couldn't provide the service at all. Others, uh, the local bus would say, were because of the increased prices, demand went down, and so we didn't get as much business. Indeed, many customers faced with increased bus fares went and used taxis, or many operators took their business and went to other resorts. So how are we going to address that? Is that a matter of simply looking at the papers or will you want expert advice on those aspects of loss? I think it would be useful. I think it would be useful. So you've got the overcharge is going to come from the expertise we've just talked about in terms of analysis of costs and prices. Now when you're looking at loss of profit opportunity, you may want some expertise to help you with the economics of, of that. So here you're talking about the third, fourth and fifth claimants. The European Commission will have provided, hopefully soon, guidance on passing on but you may want a better understanding if there is an argument about how far these costs were passed on to ultimate consumers. Now, we haven't talked about ultimate consumers, and this is quite a complicated case because 
many of these consumers will have come from outside the jurisdiction, be it Spain or Norland. And we have not introduced a consumer action here. Mm. Uh, a consumer action here would be quite complicated. Uh, the British Collective Action Scheme only allows an opt-out uh, option on collective actions for those who are domiciled in the United Kingdom. It has to be opt-in for consumers outside the United Kingdom. And it's going to be very interesting to see how that works. But in these holiday cases, uh, we have to contemplate that one day there may be a case in which we have to deal with a collective action brought on behalf of consumers from more than one member state. But I have not included that in this case study because that's really quite complicated and I'm not sure how many of our member states are anything like ready <laughs> for that. In Finland? We have to be ready for everything <laughs> <laughs> if we are not small countries. Or In Romania? We will wait for several <coughs> years to, <laughs> to implement the directive, to uh, acknowledge the, the associations, and after that we will have the opportunity, a real opportunity for the final customers in Belgium, the possibility of a class action suit is now um, real new uh, legislation and uh, it's possible. Yes. That's right. So, so Belgium has got the legislation in place. Now, can that involve Peter Will not domiciled in Belgium? I couldn't answer so right. on that question. But I think so. I think so. You just have to prove that you have interest to start a suit. Okay. So, we built up the evidence in relation to the undertaking, the infringement, the causation, the damages. We still have to manage the overall costs and we still have to manage what happens at the end of the day in terms of interest. Now, um, as Liam said, there are varieties of approaches to interest, and interest is, it, 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 to some extent, still a matter of national competence. Interest as a qualitative concept is required by the directive, but the rate of interest is not set by the directive. Now, it may be that in due course we ask the Commission to provide some soft law guidance on the setting of interest, but that hasn't happened at the moment. Uh, I don't know how you do interest at the moment. In Finland, what, do you have a standard rate of interest for? Yes, we have. Yeah. In Belgium, there are, uh, you have special higher interest between commercials, between undertakings. Yes, the same. And you have we transpose the same directive, yeah. I, I think, on this. So it's, um, mm. Okay, now, so let's deal with costs. Is there anything at this stage of managing the case that you want to do to warn the parties that whoever wins will be limited in the amount of costs they can recover? Is this a case which is of a scale where you think that the parties should be warned that they may not recover their costs if they spend too much money? I have maybe the fourth claimant is not only a victim, I think, because they have 10% commission on costs that were too high. Yeah. So they are, for a part, they are enjoying from. They have enjoyed the 10%. Very interesting point, you see. They have an offset on their damages. And so one's going to have to assess the value of that offset. The other question about the fourth claimants the fifth and the fifth claimants is that they are not in the jurisdiction do you wish to make an order at this stage for security for costs i don't know whether that exists as a possibility 
Here we've got some parties who are not going, if the case is going on in Spain, these parties are not in the jurisdiction. In fact, they're the only party in the jurisdiction. Do you, do you want to have any money paid into escrow to underline these cases so that the parties are committed and there is money there if they are not successful? Hmm? Mm. No. no. You're content that the money would be recoverable? In Spain, yes. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, for example, in Angola or something. Okay. So there are circumstances in which at this point you might, not perhaps in this case, but there are circumstances in which you might want to have security for costs. Uh, there may also be circumstances in which you may want to protect a small company from uh, the defendant's costs getting out of control. Can you do that in Romania? No, we only have it in, uh, in our law for specific cases, this possibility to secure, as you said, uh, the cost. We have it in cases like insolvency. And Mm, for the interim measures, for example, things like this, but not all of the okay. cases. So, um, we manage the case in terms of the proceedings. Uh, we decide whether all the issues must be tried or some issues are going to uh, be admitted by one side or the other. What about consensual dispute resolution or alternative dispute resolution? The directive provides that we can send people off for up to two years uh, to try and find some way of sorting out their differences. Good idea? Why not? Why not? Why not? Uh, so that's one question. Next question, do you want help from the National Competition Authority? We talked about experts, but the expertise could come from the National Competition Authority. <coughs> you're going to inform the National Competition Authority what's going on. Now remember, there's a leniency application there. What's the next question that's going to come into your mind? Do you stay the proceedings? And if you're going to stay the proceedings, at what stage do you stay them? In other words, do you wish at this point to get the documentation in from the parties, or would that be disproportionate given the possibility of an investigation by the National Competition Authority. So you're going to need to make an inquiry which you probably should address to uh, the Northern National Competition Authority and to the Commission, though in fact they are liaising on is there an ongoing investigation and should you stay yours while there is a public law case running. Similarly, if parallel proceedings have been started in two places, then again, the, the court, which is not seized in the matter, has got to decide, do they take any actions in relation to disclosure? Or do they just stop everything for the time being? Now, this is going to be a matter which depends on on the nature of the case and the nature of the parties and how far you trust the parties and their lawyers not to destroy evidence. And there's a big argument now going on about the interaction of Article 25 with fundamental rights and the right to a timely trial. So you, there's an interesting question about the speed with which things actually happen and at what point uh, you have to say to the National Authority, you've had enough time, we must get on with it. Um, so that, that, that I, I believe, is going to be a, a live issue. I think we have to watch Luxembourg to see what uh, decisions come out about this timeliness, because there are some inquiries which, by the time they've gone up to Luxembourg and back, uh, particularly if they get remitted, seem to go on for a very long time. 
And that's a real issue because the witnesses get old and retire. <laughs> And their ability to remember the facts <laughs> of the case begins to dwindle. In, in our big carbon case, the cartel started in 1938. The whistle was blown. And the defendants disappear. In the 1990s, the decision eventually emerges from appeals in the next century. And you know, by the time you get to a substantive hearing, you have to go to the cemetery. You have to go yeah, to the yeah. cemetery. So, so that's going to be a, a live issue. How do we keep these matters going at a reasonable speed? So, we've got the... Now, I need to know what time we're breaking for coffee. Where's my... Uh, can you remind me what time we're breaking for coffee? Uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. We can edit this out later. So... We've got the written evidence, we've summoned the expert, we, we hear the evidence, and now we've got to think about making the decision. And the nature of the evidence we've heard. Now, we have been empowered to estimate. Now, an estimate is an estimate. That's the word that we're engaged with. This is not going to be, at least if it is an accurate number, you know, 2,456,524 euro and 17 cents. That is spurious. <laughs> it's going to be an estimate. And there you are, you've heard all the evidence and you're sitting down and you may be sitting down with the National Competition Authority because you can ask for their help how do we go about producing a reasonable estimate in Belgium you are not binding by the advice of the quite not. You have to make your own decision. But you have to motivate if you uh, yes. the So the situation is that the advice of the expert is like soft law. You must listen to it, and if you're going to differ from it, you should explain why you are differing from it. The good reasons you have for deciding something else. And there is, in the commission soft guidance, a variety of advice about how you approach the task. So, for example, you may find that there is another airport nearby, still subject to an obligation of fair, reasonable, non-discriminatory pricing, which has modernized its bus terminal very beautifully and is charging prices at this level. And you may say it would be reasonable to take the prices here and the prices there take this from that and say that is the nature of the overcharge. You could say that you believe that the, the prices in 2009, which were subject to the undertaking of fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory pricing, were at a sensible level and you will look at how those would be indexed up to today. And you may even make an allowance for investment in improvement. And then you take that figure and take it away. Or you can say, we have been given the costs, we have analysed the costs in association with an expert, we have allowed a reasonable profit margin, and we'll take that number away. So those are three ways in which you could achieve your estimate. When you're going to do the loss of profit, you've got to make some assumptions as to the elasticities, as to the the loss of profit opportunity that occurred. And an expert can help you with broad brush ideas of what that's likely to be. But at the end of the day, you are going to have to make a judgment on what that loss of profit was. 
And it's probably going to be fairly obvious to you whether it's ridiculously low or ridiculously high. And if it's not obvious to you, it may be obvious to the Court of Appeal when he gets to the Court of Appeal. Now, if he gets to the Court of Appeal, what are you going to apply? Here you have this assessment of loss of profit opportunity. For sure, I, I, I will follow the casualty. Only in, in the limit of the casualty, I will calculate the damage. But I, I, I will go for, for the limit to... I, I, I will be very sure to not give an over damage. Yes. So giving an overcompensation is illegal under the directive. It is not our task under the directive to be punitive. It is to do full compensation, but not overcompensation. So it's no good saying, this was a wicked monopolist. We must award lots of damages. That, that would be illegal, and the Court of Appeal should strike you down. So it's got to be a plausible explanation, and one which uh, the Court of Appeal w would acknowledge now. The Court of Appeal may say, we need to understand what overcompensation means, we will send a question to the European Union Court of Justice, <coughs> what does the word overcompensation mean when it comes to a court judging loss of profit opportunity which is necessarily, as the directive tells us, hypothetical. And I feel sure that at some stage there will be a reference to, the, to Luxembourg for the judges to explain what overcompensation looks like in the context of an hypothetical factual matrix. Uh, 